Job chapter 40. 40th chapter of Job, and I'm going to ask you to stand when you find that, and we're going to read verses 3 through 5, and then the men will have prayer. Job chapter 40. Starting in verse number 3. It's the first time that Job has talked since God has spoke to him. It says, Then Job answered the Lord and said, Behold, I am vile. What shall I answer thee? I will lay mine hand upon my mouth. Once have I spoken, but I will not answer. Yea, twice, but I will proceed no further. Thank you, man. You can be seated. We don't know how long that Job has been suffering like he's been as we've been going through the book. Uh, I, I believe that it was probably months. I don't think it was just a short period of time. I believe that Job had been uh, for quite some time sitting in the, on the ash heap. And he'd been knocking on the door to heaven, I believe, with prayer. And he had seemingly not received an answer. Like I said, Job is on a, in a garbage dump, the ash heap that the Bible calls it, and that's where they, I believe, they burn garbage outside of the city, and that's where Job had taken up uh, uh, his residence. And he was scraping his skin with shards of broken pottery. Job's in a pretty sad situation. Job's been afflicted. Let me just remind you what affliction is. Affliction is undeserved, but it's permitted by God. It's almost never understood, though. There's some in this audience tonight, you've been afflicted with something. It's something health-wise, or it may be something with the family situation. You didn't deserve it. God's just permitted it to happen. In a short period of time, though, just to remind you, Job has lost his health, he's lost his wealth, and he's lost his children. And I believe Job lost his wife as well. We're going to see in chapter 42, Job's wife is still there. I believe it's the same wife that he had in chapter 2. Can you imagine going through all three of those events in one time? having your health lost, having your wealth taken away, what wealth you might have, the livelihood that you've got, it's gone, you lose your job, and then you lose your children, Every, all of them that you have, not just one, but all of them. One experience is bad, two would be devastating, but all three is horrid. And Job's anguish is compounded, I believe, by the seemingly abandonment of God. Now, we know God didn't abandon Job. But Job's been rejected, he feels like, by God. God's not spoke to him. He's also been rejected by his three friends that had come and speak to him. And I think by Elihu, who also spoke for six chapters. And, and finally, in chapter 37, I just want to remind you real quick. Uh, I believe that Elihu points out in verse 9 of 37 that a storm was on the horizon. Out of the south cometh the whirlwind. And I believe he might have even pointed to that and begin talking about how God was the God of that storm. And I believe, this is just me now in my mind, I believe that Elihu, Bildad, and Zophar probably exited at that point in time. They're still around because God's going to speak to them. But I think they probably went inside, the rain started happening, and Elihu begins to keep talking to him. But as he begins to depart, he turns around and looks before he gets indoors and says, Job, God respects nobody who is wise in their own heart. Those who are self-conceited and self-righteous, God won't hear. And Elihu had put a a judgment upon Job, and I think Elihu went inside. And then Job is left there in the rain, I believe, by himself. And then in chapter 38, it says that the Lord answered Job out of a whirlwind. We know that 
God's speech here is the longest of any time that God speaks in the Bible. And most say that there's about 77 questions that God asked Job. He didn't just come down and begin to say, here's why you're suffering. He asked him a series of questions. And you can lump those questions, I believe, into three categories. One is who created the universe. And we looked at that last week. We know who created the universe. God created it. Then the second question he asked is who controls the universe. And look in chapter 38, verse 39. He he shifts here. He's talked about uh, who has created the universe, Job. Then he comes to verse 39 of, of chapter 38, and he says, Will you hunt the prey for the lion, or will you feel the appetite of the young lions? When they couch in their dens and abide in their covert to lie and wait, who provideth, fo- who provideth the raven his food? When his young ones cry unto God, they wander for lack of meat. God says, Job, who controls the universe? You know the answer, and and Job knew the answer too. God wasn't asking that to get an answer listed from Job. He was trying to explain to Job. And God uses, in the next two chapters, He uses ten animals to explain His answer. And they're an odd assortment of animals. Some are wild. Some of them are easily domesticated. Some are very familiar animals we still have today. Some animals that He talks are extinct now. Some are two-legged animals. Some are four-legged animals. Some have wings. And I think... God may have been setting this up back in chapter 12, verse 7. Job told his friends. He says, he was debating, and Job said, But now ask the beast, and they'll teach you. And ask the fowls of the air, and they shall tell you. Job had told that basically God's creation can provide the answers for the questions that they had. Remember now, God's in the midst of answering Job, and he's doing it with a series of questions. Now, I believe just a little teaching. I think that Job, in Job's day there was a drifting away of what's called a monotheistic creation. And all that means mono is one, theistic is God. One God created the universe. We believe that. But I believe there was probably sign that was moving away from that and saying, no, there may be more. And there was what is called now pantheistic view, and that is that the universe and God are identical, that God is the universe, and God is in all around us in the universe. I want, to teach you, I want to teach you just briefly, that's not the case. God is not the universe. God created the universe, okay? There is a distinction there. I have heard people say, no, I, I, I'll be honest with you, I'm a Star Wars fan. And I love it when they talk about the force and so forth. And I've heard people equate God to the force of Star Wars. That ain't the case. God is not, not the life forms. He is the glue that keeps it all together. I heard Billy Graham say, if God ceased to exist, everything would just cease to exist. This podium wouldn't just collapse. It would just cease to exist. I would and you would as well. God created. uh, In Acts chapter 17, verse 27, don't turn there, but you can write it down. Eugene Peterson in the message, he paraphrased that verse this way. And I think it sums up God created the universe. He's not equal to it. But it says, uh, he says, starting from scratch, he made the entire human race and made the earth hospitable with plenty of time and space for living so we could seek after God. And not just grope around in the dark, but actually find Him. God doesn't play hide and seek with us. He's not remote. He's near. We live and move in Him. We can't get away from Him. God is not the sun. God is not the trees. Now, the God's Spirit is all around us, I believe. I believe that God's Spirit, if it, like I said, evaporated, then those things would cease to exist. But God is not the universe. He is around us, but God is not creation. We know that because of Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. It doesn't say in the beginning, God was the heavens and the earth. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So that dispels pantheism. God is not the universe. So when you hear people start talking about creation as being God, you step back and go, no, wait a second. That's not what the Bible says. They might tell you that you're a fool, but you can step back like David did this morning and just look at him and say, you're an idiot. I think that's the title of the sermon this morning. No, I'm just kidding. Well, it was a good sermon this morning, wasn't it? There are some accounts that there was a polytheistic viewpoint back in Joe's day. Poly means many, theistic is God, that many gods created the earth. In fact, there are some that says this is when mythology started, back around Job's time, that they looked at the sun and said, that's a god. They looked at the moon and said, that's a god. They looked at the wind or the, or the ocean and said, that's a god. They felt the wind and said, that's a god. But we know many gods didn't create the heaven and the earth because the Bible says in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Not God's, but in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Some accounts say that there was pagan evolutionism that had got in the culture of Job's day. Evolution is a fundamental 
precept of paganism. Do you realize that? Satan has come in. I believe he uses, this is my opinion, and I believe it's based off what Scripture says. He uses Muslims, he, or the uh, Islam, he uses uh, all of these Eastern religions and so forth. And when you listen to him, there is just a trace that sounds like it's truth. But if it goes contrary to what God's Word says, and if it does not place Jesus as God, they're false. And so what he wants to do is offer a counter to what Christianity has. And so there was, an, there was evolution that was talked about back then, but I'm just going to tell you, God did not choose macroevolution to create humans. Because the Bible in Genesis 1.26, God said, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. God wasn't some tadpole. God wasn't a monkey that was swinging from tree to tree. Let us make man in our image and after our likeness. Well, then it goes on in Genesis and it says, Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image, and in the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them. And God said unto them, Brief, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. Job knew this because of just what he said, Ask the beast and they'll teach you, and the fowls of the air and they shall teach you. Henry Morris, who is, was the founder of the Creation Research Society, he's dead now, he's been called the father of modern creation science. He says that, the message, that God's message to Job has eight verses dealing with the early history of the earth, 27 that deal with the physical world as it functions today, and there's 33 verses that deal with nature and the needs of animals. Did you know that all animals are part of God's creation? God placed mankind in dominion over the plant and animal kingdom. People that say, well, I don't like nature lovers. I'm a nature lover. Why? Because God created nature. I love to watch the Discovery Channel. I love to watch those lines that's out on the, out on the range. And you know what? When I see those, I think that's God's creation. And chapters 38... And 39 and 40 of Job speaks to that. Well, God, was, uh, God placed man over the dominion of the plant and animal kingdom, but sin marred that relationship. Instead of cl close harmony as was originally intended, most animals fear and dread man. And that's not the way that it was supposed to be. Because I believe that God set it up to where a lion nestled right up beside of... Uh, of, uh, of Adam in the garden. And I believe there's times in the Bible when Daniel was in the lion's den, I think it went back to that state. I believe that Daniel nestled up beside of that lion that night. And I believe probably used his mane as a coat and so forth. That was the way that God intended creation to be. Let me just tell you something. 60% of the animal species which are extinct became extinct in the 20th century. One report says that by the end of the 21st century, half of all species will be extinct. Half of all species. Wait a second, Morris, how does that relate to Christianity? Because God said he was placing man over dominion of all creation. That's in our care. God's central message to Job, I believe, and it's also to us, wasn't an explanation of why the righteous suffer. But I think that God was, was giving Job the call to sound his belief in creation and to emphasize stewardship over creation under God. And God provided a detailed reminder of how he cares for his creation in these chapters, especially the animals. And he gave Job a gentle rebuke and said, No, Job, I've not forgot about you. Jesus gave us a similar reminder in Matthew chapter 10. He says, Fear them not which kill the body and are, able to kill, and are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Then he says, Are not the two sparrows sold for a farthing? And one of them shall not fall to the ground without your father, but the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear ye not, therefore, ye are more valuable than many sparrows. Don's son gets sown tonight. God's eye is on the sparrow, and it's still on me. Well, when God moves in chapter 38, verse 39, to ask that overarching question, he says, Who controls the universe, uh, uh, Job? Can you hunt the food for the lion? Will you take the food to the lion? Will you feel the appetite of the young lions? Will you provide food for the ravens? God asked Job, where does the foot lion get their food? And Job doesn't have an answer. 
He says, who provideth for the raven his food when his young ones cry unto God and they wander for lack of meat? Who feeds the ravens? God does. Jesus answered that in Luke 12 when he said, Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap, which neither have storehouse nor barn, and God feedeth them. How much more are ye better than the fowls? And then he moves and he says in verse uh, 1 of chapter 39, he says, Knoweth thou the time when the wild goats of the rock bring forth? Or canest thou mark when the hinds do calve? Can you number the months that they fulfill? How long will it take for a wild goat to have a child? Or do you know the time when they're going to bring forth? They bow themselves. They bring forth their young ones. They cast out their sorrows. Their young ones are in good liking. They grow up with corn. They go forth and return not unto them. God asked Job, do you know when the wild mountain goats are going to give birth, Job? I do. That's what God says. Then he shifts the donkeys. I think it's interesting now that God goes through. Uh, as I was going through this, I thought, you know, this is a sermon. If Marlon, if Marlon Perkins was a preacher, he'd probably preach this sermon right here about these animals. I love watching Marlon Perkins. I always felt sorry for what was the guy's name? Jim that was always out there. He said, oh, my, Jim, watch that alligator bite you. And I'm going, why would Jim want to do that for? But anyway, he shifts to the donkeys. He says in verse 5, Who has sent out the wild ass free, or who hath loosed the bands of the wild ass? Talking about donkeys. Whose house I have made the wilderness, and the barren land his dwellings. He scorneth the multitude of the city, neither regardeth he the crying of the driver. One person said that verse 6 applied to human beings shows that true freedom is found where God places a person. You realize that? It's wherever God's planted you at. Well, Verse 8 says the range of the, of the mountains is his pasture, and he searcheth after every green, th- green thing. Let me ask you, where is your pasture? Are you searching out every green thing that's in that pasture, or are you hung up on the next pasture being greener than where you are? People will come into church. I've seen it in my 44 years. And they'll come in all excited and all on fire and everything, and they're just ready to do everything with the church. And then after about six months, they've got their feelings hurt, and you go, where's so-and-so at? Well, they're not here anymore. They got mad over something. See, they're not searching out those green things that God's put in their pasture. They're wanting to go somewhere else. Do you know sometimes your pasture just needs a little watering? Sometimes it just needs a little care to get it where it needs to be. God's placed you in a particular place, just like he did those donkeys. And look in verse 9. He talks about unicorns. He says, will the unicorn be willing to serve thee or abide by thy crib? Can the unicorn do what you say? Now, we think of a unicorn as a white horse with a large pointed spiral horn projecting from its forehead, and sometimes it's got a goat's head. A unicorn is a symbol of purity and grace. Fable says that the unicorn has the power in its horn to render poison water potable into hill sickness. And until the 19th century, belief in unicorn was widespread among historians, alchemists, writers, poets, naturalists, physicians, and theologians. Do you know most people believe that that unicorn here in Job and other places in the Bible is a word that can really be translated to mean a huge and wild fierce ox which inhabited the Middle East. Now what he's saying is they, these are wild ox, Job, that can't be, can't be tamed. Do you have the power to tame a wild ox, Job? I do. Talking about unicorns, you can go back now and say, no, unicorns in the Bible is not the kind that's got the pointed flies and all that type of stuff like kids like today. Unicorn is just a wild ox. Then he goes to peacocks and ostriches. Two... Uh, Birds that you can really contrast. Look in verse 13. Gavest thou the goodly wings unto the peacocks, or wings and feathers unto the ostrich? Peacock is a beautiful animal with exquisite feathers. And God asked Job, Job, was you the artist that painted the feathers on the plumage of the peacock? And then he mentions the wings and feathers of an ostrich. Now let me tell you, where a peacock is a beautiful and majestic bird, an ostrich is just the opposite. An ostrich can weigh over 300 pounds and grow to seven or eight feet tall. And an ostrich has no maternal instincts. When they lay an egg, wherever they are, they lay an egg. I think they're like some teenagers today. Wherever it is, it just happens. They don't look to protect anything. They just drop the egg right there. Ostriches don't really care. God didn't give ostriches intelligence. But you know what he gave them? A reliance on him. And that's what God was telling Job. Job, they're a dumb animal. But did you know when an ostrich flaps their wings, they can go up to 40 miles an hour? 
God gave them some beauty things that we don't look at and think it's beauty. And that's the same way God does us. We look at some people and think they don't have much talent. Yeah, they do. They don't have much skill. Yeah, they do. God just needs to put them where that they need to be and utilize that talent and skill. I heard somebody say one time, God ain't blessed everybody to sing because he didn't bless me to hear everybody singing. There are times people get up and I think, you know, do you think you're a blessing? No. If you get up with the right heart, you are a blessing. You hear what I'm saying? Well, then he goes to the horse in verse 19. I've never been a big fan of horses. I'll be real honest with you. I've been on a horse, I think, three times in my life. And one of them, man, she finally had to unplug it to get me to leave. <laughs> one time I was on a horse over in Hilton, Virginia, without a saddle on. Why I got up on it, and I'm going to ask Ricky McMurray sometime, why did you do that for? Ricky got me up on that horse and then hit the back of it and said, oh, take off. I didn't have no steering wheel. I didn't have no brake pedal. And I thought, what? And I just grabbed onto that mane. Finally, it came to a stop about three miles down the road. We walked back. Ricky said, where's my horse? I said, I don't know, and I don't care. <laughs> do you know he says in verse 19, he says, Job, have you given the horse strength? Have you clothed his neck with thunder, with that great mane? Can you make him afraid of the grasshopper? The glory of his nostrils is terrible or it's awesome. He paweth in the valley and he rejoices in his strength. He goeth on to meet the armed men. I like history and I've read some stuff about the Civil War. And you know, the horses back in Civil War day was just as important as the man that was doing the fight. And back in those days, the horse that a general rode or a big commander was just as well known as that commander was. Ulysses S. Grant had a horse named Cincinnatus, and it was a large horse that was a thoroughbred. And Grant actually had somebody try to buy that horse off for $10,000 in gold, and he said no. He wouldn't let anybody ride it except for Abraham Lincoln. That's how precious that horse was to him. Another horse that was famous was General Lee's horse, Traveler. He got his name from his ability to travel. He wasn't a strong or quick horse, he didn't look unusual in looks or stature, but he was exceptional in endurance. And those horses back in those days had an attitude of courage, and that's what God's talking about here. I've given these horses courage. Look in verse 22. He says, He mocketh at fear, talking about the horse, and is not affrighted. Neither turneth he back from the sword. The quiver rattleth against him, and gl the glittering spear and shield, he, I love this, he swalloweth the ground with fierceness and rage. Swallow with the ground with fierceness and rage means he eats up the ground as he gallows. Man, he can make some time that war horse can. Verse 25 says, He saith among the trumpets, Ha, ha, and he smelleth the battle afar off, the thunder of the captains and the shouting. Noise of the battle doesn't bother him. Peterson translates verse 25 in this manner. He says, At the sound of the trumpet, he neighs mightily, smelling the excitement of battle from a long way off, catching the rolling thunder of the war cries. Here is a, here is a horse that has no fear. And God says, Who gave him that attitude, Job? I did. Let me ask you, are you afraid of something tonight? I don't know what it might be. Do you know that God can take that fear away from you? That's what he tells us. He can give us a peace that passes all understanding. Whatever that is, just like he gave that horse the fear to go into battle and not give no thought to anything, God can do the same thing for you. And that's what he's telling Job. And then look in verse 26. He starts talking about a hawk and an eagle. He says, Does the hawk fly by thy wisdom, Job, and stretch her wings toward the south? Doeth the eagle mount up at thy command and make her nest on high? He asked Job, Job, have you drawn up the blueprints for the hawk's wings? You know, we didn't learn how to fly until the 20th century. All those years, man wanted to learn how to fly. And God put it in that at creation and said, here's how it's going to be. He says, can you guide the hawk where she goes? He says, do you give the eagle clearance to take off or do you tell her that she needs to make her nest way up high where it's inaccessible? It says in verse 28, she dwelleth and abideth on the rock, upon the crag of the rock, and the strong place. God provides a safe home for those eagles. And God does the very same thing for us. Is what he's telling Job. Look in verse 29. From thence, away up in that crag of the rock, she seeketh her prey, and her, high, her eyes behold afar off. Do you have eagle eyes? Have you ever heard that saying, they've got eagle eyes? An eagle can see a rabbit about a mile off. Did you know that? About 1,760 yards. The average person I read needs to be about 550 yards away to see the same rabbit. That's when somebody says, you have eagle eyes, that means you can really see a way off. 
Well, the eagle needs to, and God put that in that eagle so the eagle can be in the nest and see its food way on the ground. Well, God can give us those eyes to see what we really need as well. Do you know that? Things that we sometimes think we seemingly need, we don't need. God gave that eagle the eyes to see that rabbit way off and say, that's what I need here for my young ones. He can give us those eyes to see as well when we're on good ground like our pastor talked about this morning. Many of us want to stray off to that stony ground though. And we end up saying, why do I have these rocks in my life? The eagle knows exactly what they need because God gave it to them. There's times we don't need what we think we need. You know, I believe that an eagle is a picture of stewardship. An eagle economizes and will only bring back to the nest those things which are needful for the nest and for the little eagles. The eagles have a full reliance upon the God who created them. I've done a little reading on eagles. And you know what the mama eagle does at some point in time? We would think that it's cruel. But when the mama eagle thinks it's time for the bird to fly, you know what she does? She throws them out of the nest. And that bird will take and hit the rock and hit the rock. And I can just imagine, bless its heart, its world has just been turned upside down. Just a few seconds ago, it was in the warmth of the nest. And then after a while, it realizes, I can fly. Ain't that the same way God does us? God will call us to do something. We stumble around on it and stumble around on it and don't want to do it and so forth. And I believe that there's times. Now, God don't kick you out and just abandon you, but I believe there's times God says, you know what, you're going to do this. I remember when uh, one of our kids was taking swimming lessons. We took them to Dobbins Bandit. We went in. They was just about four years old. And when you got a four-year-old child, you want to be right there with them all the time. The instructor came over to me and Angie said, Mr. and Miss Baker, you can't stay. And I said, well, why not? Because your child's going to learn how to swim. I said, but my child don't know how to swim, and you've got water in here. Well, come to find out, what they literally did was tuck and put a vest on them and threw them in the water. That's the best way sometimes to jump into ministry. Do you realize that? Sometimes you step back and think, well, God's calling me to do this. And you think, well, I'm not going to do that. I can't do that. If God's called you to do something, you need to exercise that and do it. And I'll go this far and say this. It may not be at this church. But if God's called you to do something, He has a place out there, just like He said to the donkey, wherever you are, that's where I planted you at. God's got a place for you out there to exercise your gift that He's given you. The eagles had a full reliance upon God who created them. And then look at Job's response in chapter 40. It says, First, moreover, the Lord answered Job and said, Shall he that contendeth with the Almighty instruct him? He that reproveth God, let him answer it. And then Job answered the Lord and said, Behold, I am vile. What shall I answer you? I'll lay mine hand upon my mouth. Once I have spoken, but I will not answer. Yea, twice, but I will proceed no further. We know based off what Job said that he basically said, I forgot all I wanted to say, and he was just consumed by the awesomeness of God. Peterson paraphrases this verse. I love this. After God got done talking his first time, Job says, I'm speechless. I'm in awe, and words fail me. I should have never opened my mouth. I've talked too much, way too much, and I'm ready to shut up and listen to you. Now, I'm going to tell you something. There's some watershed moments in the book of Job. And on over, we're going to see that the Bible says God takes Job's captivity from him. He restores him back. But there is some point in time that Job makes a change. Job hadn't sinned, so he didn't need to do any repenting. Job, I believe, though, was hearing God speak. And I believe at a certain point in time, that cry that he was saying, I want God to answer me and I want to talk back with him. Job realized no. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever been in a storm or had some problem happen in your life? And in the midst of that, some of y'all are going to know what I'm talking about. Some may not. In the midst of that, God speaks to you. And it changes your whole perspective on what's going on. You ever had that happen? You can't explain it. All you know is everything's okay. When Don sung that song this morning, the quartet, when the storm passes by, Friday I was at Meadowview for a breakfast. And I had my iPod out and I was looking at some things and the weather channel popped up and said, a, a tornado watch in Kingsport. And I looked outside and I said, it's pretty here at Kingsport. And I got to looking and it said, uh, it's going to be coming up Sir Goinsville, Rogersville. And I got to scrolling down and it said, if you're in the Bloomingdale Hilton area, you need to seek shelter. Well, I wasn't in that area, but Angie was. And I went running outside and I said, called and I said, hey, is it raining at the house? She said, no. And I said, well, a tornado is, is coming your way, so you need to seek safety. I'm going to tell you something. All I had in my mind was Angie was at the house 
and a tornado was coming. A storm was heading to her. You hear what I'm saying? Well, then it got time that the tornado watch was over with. And I called her back. And I said, hey, did it ever rain? She said, no, it never did storm. You know what I said? Thank you, Lord, that the storm just passed on by. Let me tell you something, folks. When we have stuff going on in our life, we have problems coming in our life, if we, just like Job did, we cry out. I'm gonna tell, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but over in Job chapter 42, God speaks to the three guys. And He says, you know what? Y'all's messed up. You should have kept the same line that Job was going. He had the right perspective of me. I'm going to tell you something. I don't know what's going on in your life. Don't have a clue. I don't know if it's financial. I don't know if it's health. I don't know what it is, but God does. And I do know this, based off of what God said in His Word. You cry out to Him, you draw nigh to Him, and He will draw nigh to you. That you can step back, I believe, like Job. Don, if that song had been around back in Job's day, I believe Job would have sung it in probably chapter 42. That the storm just passed on by. Well, Job finally got the place that he realized, you know what, I'm just consumed by God's awesomeness. I believe Job realized, you know what, God? You're taking care of all these animals. Your eye never left me. You knew exactly that I was right here on this garbage dump, sitting here scraping myself, throwing me a pity party ever so often. I believe Miss Job was still standing there watching him, and I think she probably heard what was taking place as well. There's a lady by the name of Sybilla Martin, who was a friend of a vibrant Christian couple by the name of Mr. and Miss Doolittle. Miss Doolittle was bedridden, Mr. Doolittle had to get around in a wheelchair. This was about 75 years before the American for Disabilities Act, 1905. The Doolittles never complained. And instead of just needing comfort and encouragement, they comforted and encouraged. One day while Mr. and Ms. Martin were visiting with their friends, Ms. Martin asked, Mr. Martin asked Ms. Doolittle the secret of her happiness. How come you're always uh, vibrant? How come you're always uh, lifted up laying here in this bed and your husband in a wheelchair? Miss Doolittle looked at her and said, The secret to my happiness is his eye is on the sparrow, and I know that he watches me. Well, Miss Martin wrote that song then that we have today. Don sung, Why should I feel discouraged? Why should the shadows come? Why should my heart be lonely and long for heaven and home? When Jesus is my portion, my constant friend is he. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. Let me ask you, this is your life. I sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free. For his eye is on the sparrow, and I know that he watches me. I just want to leave you tonight with this thought. Maybe we need to be quiet like Job did and just listen to the awesome wonder of the Savior who created the universe and, who, and realize that if his eye is on the sparrow and it's on the lion and it's on the young lion and the raven and the wild goats and the donkey, and the unicorn or the wild ox, and the peacock and the ostrich, and the horse and the hawk and the eagle, if his eye is on all of those and he provides for them, then we can know that he watches and provides for us that much more. You going through something tonight? I can promise you, draw nigh to him, he'll draw nigh to you. That's not just something the preacher's standing up, sounding all self-righteous about. No, I believe what God's Word says. I'll tell you this too, I've experienced that. Times that I've had to say, you know what, God, this is totally out of my control right now. And I believe he says, just like Job, that's right. And I'm in constant and complete and sovereign and supreme control. You know he's in control of your life tonight? You sit there and you say, Morris, I'm not a Christian. He's still in control of your life tonight. He's brought you in here to tell you that God loves you, that Jesus died for you, and he wants to come in and be your Savior and to walk with you for the rest of your life. And set you up in that position where you can draw nigh to him. And he'll draw nigh to you. Whatever you need is tonight. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much that you are a God that is in complete control. And as you teach us in the book of Job, we are to, uh, we've got dominion uh, and control over, over nature and the animals. And Father, but you've got control over all that. And I ask you just to keep, just to keep us a constant reminder of that. That regardless of what takes place, your eye is on us. You know exactly what we're going through at any moment in time, you just let us step back and point praise to you. Somebody here tonight may not know you as our Savior. I pray that your Holy Spirit has dealt with them, and this will be the night they'll accept you, and they'll walk out of this place a new person. Maybe somebody just needs to draw an eye to you. Whatever the need is tonight, we know you're a great and awesome God, and you'll meet it. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.